Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody who's in here. Good morning, everyone in the foyer. You guys can make your way in. We're actually going to begin with kind of a gathering song, so let's stand together. We're going to sing, sing the Lord's Prayer as we just enter into his presence together because we're here together as his church. So Nathan's going to start us off. We're going to put our hands together and, and sing. There you go. Go with Nathan. Come on, we need some. There we go. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day a daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day your daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them. kingdom come it's yours it's yours all yours all yours the kingdom the power the glory are yours it's yours it's yours all yours all yours forever and ever the kingdom is yours it's yours it's yours all yours, all yours, the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, forever and ever. The kingdom is yours. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart, on earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you can give it up to the Lord. Absolutely. Ready to go? Test one, two. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us here today as we uh, gather together here in God's house. If you're new, if you're visiting, um, please take a moment to fill out a connection card so we can know a little bit about you. If you have any questions, prayer requests, jot those down. You could do that online. You can do it through a QR code right there on the screen in front of you, or you can use the uh, cards on the benches in front of you there and just drop those in the um, connection hub on the way out or in the boxes in the back of the sanctuary and we'd be happy to meet with you and visit with you and thank you very much for your continued generous even radical generosity here uh, in your giving there's three different ways to give you can give through the Sunday offering the traditional way with the envelopes again you could drop those in the boxes back of the sanctuary or you can give online or you can give through the church app and even by text so Technology is quite amazing these days, uh, so thank you for that. In two weeks, uh, on Sunday after church, we're going to be having uh, Zach and Anna 
uh, our new youth pastors um, or youth pastor and, and missus, and they're going to be with us for a get acquainted lunch. We're going to do a potluck soup lunch, and we're looking for folks to uh, bring a potluck, um, a crock pot full of soup, any soup, any be creative. I mean, I, I heard even chili could qualify as soup. So we're looking for folks to bring uh, a crock pot full of soup, and that is in two weeks. And we'll be available here um, before service to get you set up in the gym. And uh, we'll be saying hello to Zach and Anna with an official potluck luncheon. And uh, that's coming up in just two weeks. So, Also, Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes are in the lobby. Uh, many of you are familiar with that. We do that regularly. And if you'd like to grab a box or two for a gift for uh, a child, a boy or girl, the instructions on how to do it are inside the box. And uh, just take one of those home, and the instructions will show you what to do. Those boxes go all around the world through the Ministry of Samaritan's Purse to young people, children in uh, difficult situations, sometimes very poor situations, and uh, touch some hearts. And God bless you for those who are generous in that way. Uh, let's pray together as we begin. Father, as we are gathered here today, we commit our hearts to you. We commit this time to you. We pray, Lord, that you'd merge the two, Lord, that our hearts would meet um, as we give you this time and as you give us your focus and attention on this uh, Sunday. Lord, we pray for our worship team. We pray for those who are presenting your word before us. And we ask you, Lord, to give us ears to hear and hearts that can digest what you're telling us, speaking to us, and showing us. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. All right, let's, let's stand together as we worship the Lord in song. And as we do, I'm going to read a few scriptures. I don't know if anybody has had, hopefully you've had moments this week, anybody, where you're just looking at the beauty of the colors changing this fall and... Hopefully it's stirred up your heart to just praise him, you know, just worship him in the daily rhythms of life. Um, my heart was turned to this uh, yesterday. I was talking to a dad at the family conference, and he was just talking about just sitting in the woods. He's a hunter, okay? But just sitting in the woods and just seeing the beauty of, his, of God's creation, and it was just doing something in his heart, right? And so we were talking about Psalm 19. This is the NLT, the first four verses. It just says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God, the skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. Like, have we been listening? Have you guys been listening? Man, his creation is declaring who he is, declaring his glory before us day after day, night after night. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. And another passage, Romans 1.20, just says that his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they, it's talking about people, are without excuse. Creation's screaming creator. So we're just going to sing a few songs just worshiping him as our creator. And uh, the first one is indescribable. And I know that I talked to our drummer this morning. He's in college. He was three when this was written. I was a senior in high school, so I begin to feel quite old now because these college kids don't know these songs. But um, Older Song is originally written by a gal named Laura Story, and she was on a journey driving through the Appalachian Mountains in the fall, and just her heart was just wrapped up in worship. And she literally wrote this song driving in the car. She got back to Nashville, and the song was, was written, so even if it is new to you, or even if it seems old to you. Let's just bring our hearts to him and worship him and give him the glory that's due his name this morning. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring 
Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky And you know them by name You are amazing God All powerful, untamable Awestruck we fall to our knees As we humbly proclaim You are amazing God Who has told every lightning bolt Where it should go Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow Who imagined the sun gives source to its light Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night None can fathom indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them you are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Incomparable, unchangeable. You see the depths of my heart. You love me the same. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. It's okay to clap for the Lord. That's good. Fearest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O Thou of God and man the Son. cherish thee will I honor thou my soul's glory joy and crown fair are the meadows fair is still the woodlands is purer who makes the woeful heart to sing fair is the sunshine fair is still the moonlight and all the twinkling stars shines brighter Jesus shines purer than all the angels have can boast beautiful Savior Lord of the nations Glory and honor 
restoration now and forevermore be thine. Amen. Lord, that's our prayer as we come to you this morning. We've seen your beauty displayed throughout creation, which is meant to draw us to you from the scriptures that we read. And Lord, we give you the glory. That's do your name. Would your name be brought glory both now and forevermore in this moment and in our homes, our families, our lives, Lord, everything. We give it to you again. And so we commit this time to you. Would you be our teacher in this time? Lord, help our hearts to receive whatever you have for each and every one of us individually. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, Children's Church, first through fifth grade, is dismissed. If you're not checked in, kids or parents, make your way back to the Connection Hub. Go back and see Zach or Chris and get checked in this morning. You're going to have a great time back in Children's Church. And uh, it's always exciting to see what takes place. I want to encourage parents, as you uh, sit down with dinner with your kids after church, ask them what they've learned, how that applies to their life, and just kind of get a pulse on what's going on back in Children's Church, a great ministry back there. This morning, as we continue through our series, Family Matters, Proverbs from the Home, uh, we're wrapping up a weekend where we've had Leah Broach, the National Director for Alliance Kids at the Christian Missionary Alliance, our denomination, the, the larger church family that we belong to. Leah's been here this weekend with some other speakers uh, for our parenting conference, Big World, Bigger God. And if you didn't have a chance or an opportunity to hear from her, you're going to be really grateful that you're here this morning. She's going to be coming and sharing from God's Word, but also sharing about the kids' ministry and the, the role, the impact that we have on discipleship on our children and the children in our community. So we're going to pray. I'm going to have Leah come up and pray, and then we're going to listen to what God has to say through her this morning. Leah, come on up. and Let's prepare our hearts this morning, family. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to hear from your word. We thank you for our sister, for Leah, for uh, the ministry that you've called her to in leading the National Alliance Kids Ministry Program for the Alliance we thank you for the opportunity we've had this weekend to hear from her and from other speakers on the importance of discipleship and leading our children to follow hard after Jesus. We pray that you would speak through her this morning as she shares. And we ask all of this in the strong and precious name of Jesus, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Leah, it is an honor and a privilege to have you here. We're thankful for you and your ministry and looking forward to hearing what God has to share through you this morning. Thank you so much. Well, it is a delight to be here. You have a beautiful town. I'm just, I shared on Friday night, it was very kind of you all to make sure the leaves were perfectly timed for my arrival. Um, it's been so refreshing to, to be here and enjoy the fall colors and to be with your people and enjoy this family conference. Um, it delights my soul to see churches and families engaged in discipling the next generation. Um, that's my job. I uh, serve our um, nearly 2,000 U.S. churches and some of our churches abroad, our mission works abroad, helping people understand the process of uh, discipling the next generation, family ministry, children's ministry, faith formation, um, and I write a lot of our curriculum that I believe you all are using here, and that's really exciting. And I also get to share a lot through our Alliance Life magazine. And uh, today, I just really want to encourage us. Uh, I want to, to look in God's Word and see what He says about the next generation and sort of share a story that we're all familiar with. But I, I hope to pull out something a little different maybe that you haven't seen or noticed before or think a little bit uh, differently about it. How many of you all are familiar with Daniel in the Bible? Daniel, yes. Uh, for whatever reason, when I was a small child, my absolute favorite story in Scripture was Daniel in the lion's den. A lot of times at our home, my dad would uh, lead us in devotions in the evening, and sometimes we would all pile in mom and dad's bed 
for, for that. And um, oftentimes he'd have a plan, but sometimes he would say, what do you want me to read tonight? And without fail, every single time, I would say, dang, on the lion's den. And I'm not exactly sure why that was so fascinating to me, except I had this picture that these lions were massive. Think like Lion King, that they all looked like that. And uh, that Daniel was thrown down in there, and they just turned into like these stuffed teddy bear lions, and that Daniel curled up and slept with them and petted them. I had this whole imagination going of what it must have been like. And and when the king was so nervous, Daniel was down there having the time of his life. That's really what I pictured. I have no idea (laughs) if that's exactly what took place. We do know that God did spare Daniel in a very scary situation. But as I've grown over my lifetime and in this work that I do and being a parent myself, I often think about what made the difference, not just in Daniel's life, but in the lives of his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we're going to take a look a little bit at their journey, their story today, to see if there are things that we can glean from that in order to raise and reach our own Daniel generation Um, I shared this weekend a lot that while I'm here, I've been here to talk about your families and your family ministry and the things that, excuse me, that you're doing with your own children. I also want us to think very deeply that as a faith community, as a church, all of the children that walk through these doors are ours. And we have a responsibility to shepherd and disciple and give them the community that God designed for them. And not just the children that walk through the doors, but the children that live around you in your communities, in your neighborhoods, that maybe attend school with your kids. We have a responsibility to pass on the good things that God has given us. So let's dive in to the book of Daniel and see what God has to say to us today. I'm going to be reading from Daniel chapter 1, and I apologize. I'm using my laptop because my eye doctor gave me a new prescription, and I cannot read my Bible right now. So if you will uh, bear with me, I'll give you a moment to turn. It's always interesting in this new world. Uh, You used to wait till you heard the pages stop turning, but now everyone has an electronic Bible, so... I'll give you just a second to get there. We're going to read the whole first chapter. So I promise you it won't take forever. And I'll do my best not to be too terribly Southern in my reading. But I make no promises. I did grow up in Tennessee. So, (laughs) all right, Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put it in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Asphinehaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, Handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter into the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord the king who has assigned you food and drink. Why should you see, uh, why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had pointed over him, 
over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please take your servants for 10 days. Test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to test to do this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. So that was a lot of words to set the stage for the story. We have a king who's come in and taken over a land and has taken prisoners, captives. Not only that, he also took sacred articles from the temple uh, from the Israelites Uh, which we know that uh, people are definitely more sacred than the items. But the king was really making a point when he sieged the land. It wasn't just the land and the people. He was uh, making a point to say, I'm in charge. I'm getting rid of your ways. I'm getting rid of your gods, the way that you worship, all of these things. And not only that, he took those temple items and put them in his shrine to his god. So it was a very... Um, slap in your face, humbling, terrible time for uh, the children of Israel. Now, if you read the whole book of Daniel, you know that you see that God uses Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in multiple ways throughout their journey. Um, You're probably familiar with the fiery furnace and different things, the lion's den like we mentioned, and the way that Daniel interpreted dreams. But today what I really want to talk about is What made the difference in the lives of those young men, uh, probably early teens all the way through their adulthood, what made the difference for them to hold firm to their faith in a land of captivity where everything was not as it had been in their lives, where no one was influencing them with the ways of the Lord? What made the difference in their lives? You know, I... um, I'm a mom of two teenage boys, well, almost teenage, one's 16, one's 12, Um, and every time I read this, I think about my kids, and if they were presented with a king steak dinner, (laughs) would they choose that or a bowl of vegetables? Um, Hopefully that the, the, the teachings of their family and of their faith would help them make good decisions in their lives. But I just think for a moment of teenage boys presented with the food from the table. You know, here's the thing. They were in captivity. But their initial captivity, other than being taken, which was terrible, don't get me wrong. But captivity for them in the beginning really wasn't that bad of a deal. They were selected because of their looks, because of their intelligence. They were brought to the palace. They were given pretty much anything they wanted and needed, special treatment, special food. There was really no reason for them to not say, hey, we'll just play along. And I wonder sometimes in our own lives when we're faced with situations like that, how do we respond Obviously, I doubt any of us have been uh, besieged by a king and taken into captivity. But sometimes in this world, I feel like the culture that we live in right now and the way that that things are going, it's easy for believers to feel a little bit captive to the ways of the world. We have to be so careful about what we say and who we are, what we stand for. Cancel culture is out there to get us. Uh, People don't understand. If we represent biblical truth, suddenly we become racist, bigots, whatever, fill in the blank, without people even giving us a chance to explain what God's true love is really all about. And oftentimes when we're faced with that type of pressure, we choose 
many of us choose to just kind of go quiet and go small. We may not forsake our beliefs, but we're certainly not out there trying to cause attention to it. And if we're not careful, we're just living along in the land of captivity, eating from the rest of the table like everybody else, doing our thing, just trying to stay with the flow. But something was different in the lives of these three young, four young men. Something changed. Something about their story defined them in a way that helped them not to just say, oh, well, here we are. Let's make the most of it. And I absolutely love to um, dig into God's Word and study Bible history. And one of my favorite things, people sometimes uh, find this fascinating, but I love to teach kids through the Old Testament. I really do, uh, because I'm very passionate that children understand the whole story of God's Word the whole plan of redemption, because if we're not careful, we can pick apart pieces of the Bible and just learn this little thing or that little thing, or we might focus on the characters of the Bible, and we miss the overarching story of who God is and what he's trying to tell us down through the history, through the children of Israel, through the people that he chose to do his work. And I love taking kids on the journey through the Old Testament because I want them to see through the lives of others, that God was trying to show his people time and time again that only he could save, only he could redeem, only he could rescue them. And, you know, in the Old Testament, the way that I describe it to children is, you know, we start with creation. God made his people, and it was beautiful, and it was good. And then sin entered the world, and humans chose to uh, forget who they were and listen to the lies of Satan And the fall of humanity came, and then we see this journey through Scripture of people uh, trying to save themselves, don't we? We see it often. And as, as we go through the patriarchs of the faith and we see the nation of Israel growing, there comes a time where they start asking for a king. Do you remember this in Scripture? They're like, we want a king, we want a king. And, and God's trying to tell him through, the, through his prophet that the people don't need a king. They have me. I'm their leader. But they were like, we want to be like the other nations. We want to look cool like everybody else. We want a king. And so God said, okay, you can have a king. And do you remember who the first king of the nation of Israel was? That was so quiet. Thanks. I'm a kid's person, so I'm going to make you talk. <laughs> Saul was the first king. And we see early on in Saul's journey that while he had some good attributes, he was never going to be the savior of the nation of Israel. It was not going to happen. We see the journey through Saul's life. Things fell apart. He did some terrible things. And then comes King Thank you. And David comes in wonderful. He slays a giant. He has these uh, beautiful passages in Scripture. There's wonderful, beautiful things about David. And David is described as as a man after God's own heart. And there's so many wonderful attributes about David. But did David get it all right? No. Matter of fact, the end of David's reign was kind of dismal, to say the least. And after David, we can go through the Old Testament and start seeing the journey of the kings. So there were some good ones. There were some bad ones. There were some good ones. There were some bad ones. And what I teach kids is there was this cycle of sin. That's what I call it, the cycle of sin, where for a while the people would do okay. They would stay true to their God. And then sure enough, someone would come to power or something would happen and they would fall away until eventually they would find themselves in captivity. And it wouldn't be long after they were in captivity, they would start to call out to God for rescue. And God in his faithfulness always sent rescue. Now, it wasn't always immediate. Sometimes it was years and years and years and years and years of captivity. But it never lasted. People would do well. They would fall into captivity. God would rescue over and over. All through the kings, we see this until we get to the birth of Christ and we realize he's the only true king that can save us, that has what we need to keep us from the bondage of this world. But 
I want to look at the history for a moment of Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach's life. What happened in their lives to help them become who they were? Because I think that that is a cue we can take as we're raising our children and the children of this community to seek after the Lord to be resilient followers of Jesus. Now, I don't have time to read all of this to you, but I can tell you that we're going to be in the Second Chronicles uh, 33 and 34, but we're going to take a look at the three kings prior, and I'm just going to give you Leah Broach's summary of the three kings, not to be confused with the we three kings of Orient are. Um, so first, we are going to look, and these would have been uh, all in succession, okay? The first king that we're going to look at is uh, the king Manasseh, and it's found in Second Chronicles 33. Now, Manasseh was some guy, let me tell you. He started out on a terrible path. He was a very evil king. Uh, scripture has... Um, some choice words for him. He was a very evil king, even though he was uh, a child from the Israelites. He was an evil king. Uh, scripture tells us he even sacrificed his own children to pagan gods. Now, can you imagine that? From God's chosen people, a king from the nation of Israel that was so evil, he was worshiping pagan gods and sacrificing his own children. Scripture describes Manasseh's reign as more evil than the pagan nations that God had destroyed on behalf of the nation of Israel. There's not a good thing to say about Manasseh at this point in his reign. But towards the end of his reign, he was taken into captivity. Uh, he was imprisoned and thrown uh, down into a cell, and it says, the Bible tells us that during this time, he actually humbled himself before the Lord, and God heard his prayer. Now, in all transparency, I have some conflicting feelings about that. I am grateful that God hears our hearts of repentance and offers forgiveness, but this guy was wretched, but God heard him and accepted his repentance, and he actually restored Manasseh back to reign, and Manasseh changed his ways, thank God. And he started to tear down some of the idols and to do better. The end of his years was far better than the beginning of his years. But if you, if you really get into the history of it, he did a lot of good things in his later years, but he didn't quite get rid of all the evil. The next king after him, which would have been one of his sons, was Ammon. Ammon did not choose to follow King Manasseh 2.0. <laughs> he followed the ways of his father before his repentance. And there's really not a lot in Second Chronicles about him other than to say that he never humbled himself. He also worshipped and sacrificed to false gods and... He must have been really well-liked because he was assassinated by his own officials. So he did not go out with a bang. There's not a lot said about him, but his legacy, the legacy that he left was certainly uh, nothing positive to be remembered. But then the next king, Josiah. Now, I love this passage in Scripture in Josiah. It represents one of the greatest revivals in Scripture. And we're actually going to read this together. We're going to start in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 1. And we're just going to read uh, the first few verses through verse 8. And I'll set the stage for you. It'll tell you in our passage. But Josiah came into his reign, his kingship, at only eight years old. Anybody in here have an eight-year-old in your house? Anybody? Would you like them to become the president of the United States? <laughs> uh, uh, no comment. There might be some positives to that in the way this world works these days. But um, Josiah took the throne at age eight. Uh, and here's what I want you to see from this uh, before we read this, is that God does a work in the hearts of our kids. 
He's not terribly concerned about the age that we are ever in our life. He's more concerned about the tenderness of our heart. So let's read this together. Chapter 34. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father, David. Actually, it would have been more like his great-great-grandfather, which I find this interesting because in his lineage, Manasseh would have been there, Amon would have been there, but it doesn't say he followed any of those. He followed after the ways of King David, and he did not turn aside to the right or the left. In the eighth year of his reign, which would have put him, let's do math, if he was eight, in eight years, he is 16. I have a 16-year-old, I can tell you right now. He does not need to be president or king. Love him dearly, but he's not ready. Uh, In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. And in his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places. Those were the places where people were sacrificing to uh, false gods. He purged them of the high places, Asherah poles, and idols. And under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down. He cut them to pieces, the incense altars that were above them, and he smashed the Asherah poles and the idols. Now, this one, this part right here really is something. Then he broke the pieces and scattered them. Some translation says he pulverized it to ashes. But he scattered these things over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He even burned the bones of the priests on their altars, these false god priests, these priests that were leading people in false worship. He exhumed their bodies, burned their bones, and... uh, purged Judah and Jerusalem. He was making a point to let his people know, we will not stand for this evil anymore. In the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and in the ruins around them, he tore down the altars and the Asherah poles and crushed the idols to powder, cut to pieces all the incense altars throughout all of Israel, and then he went back to Jerusalem Verse 8 says, in the 18th year of Josiah's reign to purify the land and the temple, he sent uh, Saphon, son of Azaliah and Messiah, the ruler of the city with Joah, son of Jonah, and the recorder to repair the temple of the Lord his God. So step one, he said, we're not standing for this evil anymore. Um, And if you go back and you read some of the kings, even the kings that did good things didn't always tear down these Asherah poles and these shrines. They kind of leave that stuff alone. But Josiah, 16-year-old Josiah said, this can't be good. We have to get rid of it. And we have to do it in a way that people know and remember and understand that this is evil. And I think he probably accomplished that with the digging up of the bones and the burning and the scattering. Um, It wasn't meant to be... uh, gross or anything like that. It was meant to, sh- to prove a point to the people that we want nothing to do. We don't, he wanted to pulverize these things so small that at no point could anybody behind him dig anything back up again and re-erect them to be something to worship. He was like, no, we're not letting this happen. Not on my watch, he says. And if you, f- if you go on through the rest of, of his story, the next step is he commissions a team to begin restoring the temple. And this is the part I don't have time to read to you all, but I will share this part with you. He commissions this team to rebuild the temple, and he has people that are working. And in the process, as they are uh, renovating, clearing out the rubble, then is when they actually uncover the law. God's word to the people. It was only then. So what Josiah was doing was based off of what he knew and remembered. It had nothing to do with what he had read or understand from God's word. It was then in the temple that they found it. And so uh, they, they find the word. Josiah commissions them to take it to a prophetess to have it read. And she, um, a godly prophetess, and she tells them basically, yeah, you guys are in trouble because the, this land is going to be taken into captivity again. Um, and if you follow through the journey of what happens, 
uh, it turns out that, that Josiah is informed that God is intending to bring his people back in captivity, but because of what Josiah had done, it would not happen in his reign. It would be in the reign after him. And so uh, the, that book of Second uh, Chronicles chapter 34, it ends with Josiah calling all of the people together, and he stands and reads the law, God's word, to all the people, which is really important because this was not a nation of people that were literate, that had access to these things, but he stood and read every word of it because he wanted people to understand their responsibility to God, to understand how wicked they had been and how important it was to turn back to God. And he didn't want anyone to have an excuse not to know because they couldn't read or they didn't get a copy in the mail or they missed that email. <laughs> this was the king taking ownership for his people and giving them God's commands. Now, why do I share this history? Well, if we look at the timeline in the lives of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Josiah was actually the king when Daniel was born. He wasn't the king when Daniel went into captivity, but he was the king when they were born. And that means that Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, that's a lot of names to say, um, were given a heritage, a godly heritage, that made a tremendous difference in their life. They didn't get taken off to captivity without anything to go off of. They had been instructed in God's words. They knew the truth. They watched their family, their leaders, follow the right paths, stay committed to God's word. But at some point, these children, these teenagers, had to make their faith their own. And we see that when they enter into this. They had to personally trust, believe, and practice the faith that was handed to them. No one could do it for them. And we are faced with a similar challenge. We have our children in our midst for a short time. We have a short time to give them the things that they need to be able to withstand the world that's waiting for them, the world that's here right now. And we have to give them the opportunity to let their faith become their own. But we have to give them the structure from which to stand on. And that is why I'm so passionate about getting God's word into the hearts of our kids because what does God's word tell us? It's powerful and it will not return void. It is the bedrock of truth that helps us hold firm in a storm where we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, yesterday I was having a conversation with someone and they were talking about a, a young adult that they encountered that um, was had given their life to Christ and and I believe it was a young woman, and she was just saying how much peace she had now because before she would get up every morning and check all of social media and figure out what she was supposed to be for the day, like what thing you were supposed to stand for, what you're supposed to promote, what would get you canceled, what wouldn't get you canceled. And if you are very familiar with social media at all, it's a changing landscape. From one day to the next, things are good, things are bad. But when she encountered Christ and got into God's word, she realized, I don't have to be swayed by this. I can be at peace. I don't have to worry about who's in power, who's on the throne, what politician I'm voting for, who's making this, who's doing that. I know the truth, and I can live my life based on that. And I believe that's exactly what our friends in Daniel knew and took for themselves. I mean, it was a pretty risky thing. Teenagers are awesome because they are pretty bold. They'll say things that sometimes are like, oh, my goodness, why did you say that? You know? Like, I can imagine if I were an outside observer watching Daniel say to the king's person, hey, dude, I, I'm going to turn down that steak dinner. I could imagine me going, what? You're going to get yourself killed. Shut up. <laughs> you know? But Daniel's like, nope. You know, I was taught better than this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it down, and we're just going to see what happens. Now, do you think Daniel had any clue what would happen? No. But he had faith that what he had been taught would come to fruition in his life. And that faith paid off. Now, we know that God favored these young men, and he blessed them, and he gave them courage. 
But I believe that that came after, that came after their choice to be brave, to hold firm to their faith, and to stand up for what uh, they had been taught, what they believed, what they'd seen God do in the lives of the people that had come before them. I know that I hope to leave that type of seed of faith and truth in the lives of my own children and the ones that I'm responsible for shepherding. I hope I give them what they need to cultivate it their whole lives. You know, I don't know my own heritage very far. I don't have an ancient book to tell me all the people that came before me. I do know a little bit of who came before me really just to my great-grandparents, and that's about it. Beyond that, I don't know. But I stand here with DNA from people far back, and their stories have weaved their way into my life. And part of who I am is because of where I came from and the people. One of my grandfathers was a pastor, and I know that part of my story of who I am is directly influenced by his commitment to love the Lord and to raise my father in the ways of God. And I am determined to give that same heritage to both my children and the children that I am responsible for shepherding in this world. You know, I think about how God designs a seed. And I love to garden. It's one of my favorite hobbies and pastimes. And there's just something phenomenal I don't want to use the word mysterious because I know it's God designed, but to the rest of the world, I would say it's a little bit mysterious the way a seed works. Everything that it needs to flourish as a plant is packed inside into this tiny little hard cased seed. But that seed can only grow when something happens. What has to happen to the seed? You have to plant it, but you can plant some seeds that never grow. Something has to happen to the seed. It has to break open, doesn't it? It has to break open so that it can germinate and grow. If the seed stays shut up, it's never going to produce the life that it needs to produce. And that's the same for us. Those of us who have the truth of God in our lives and we have the hope of salvation, we know Jesus as our Redeemer, We are packed with everything we need, and God is waiting for us to break open and let it grow out. And he's waiting for our children to do the same thing. And sometimes it takes difficult circumstances for us to break open and blossom and bloom and do the things that we were designed to do. But God promises a harvest for those who are faithful to trust him in the process. And we see that in the lives of these children of Israel now, I want to I finish out today by, um, I want to show you a picture, if I can get that up here. This is a picture of a desert in the country of Chile. This is the Atacama Desert. Um, and this is considered the world's driest nonpolar desert. I mean, it looks happening, doesn't it? There's a lot going on there. It's beautiful as it is, but I don't want to have a flat tire there. Um, There are some weather stations throughout this desert that have never recorded a single drop of rain ever, (laughs) ever, ever. But there is a phenomenon that happens rarely, somewhere between five and ten years. It requires a combination of precipitation, temperature, the right light. Some people even say the tides. Uh, Some think it's dependent on El Nino, but even that's not a proven fact. But whatever happens in God's divine purpose and time, something happens in this desert that's quite amazing. See, just underneath uh, the the sand that you see there are millions and billions of uh, seeds that get carried in by the wind that lie dormant forever. They're just sitting there. There's nothing to help them break open, germinate, and grow. But in God's perfect timing, with just the right circumstances, once in a while, something happens called a super bloom. And can you show that picture? It's unbelievable. This is the same desert. It is covered with flowers. 
covered. People come from near and far to see it. There's all sorts of things you can read about it. It's considered one of the most unbelievable phenomenons that something so dry and barren can turn into something so lush and beautiful, full of life. And I think that God loves to show himself parts, parts of himself to us through nature. We were, we were singing about that this morning. Um, and I think he's showing us the power of the seed here in this desert. That when we have what we need to grow and flourish, we can. And when our children are given the truth of who God is, and they are allowed to let their faith become their own, they too will be a super bloom for God's glory. And I get so excited because there are things happening all over this world with young people, teenagers, children. We may not see it a whole lot right here, but I think we're starting to see it. You've heard of these revivals popping up on college campuses. God is breaking open the seeds in this next generation, and I cannot wait to see the harvest to come. And I may never see it. I may never see it, but I know God is faithful to grow in the desert that which he intends to be an, a display of his glory. And I know, like, I want to be like Josiah, and I, I challenge all of us to, to take that same stance that not on our watch, not will we not pass on what God has given us to this next generation. So I'm going to close in prayer, and I just want you to picture in this moment, maybe it's your own children, children in this church, your grandchildren, maybe you are a college student and you've got younger siblings, or you, what, whatever, Where, wherever you are in life, not one person in this room does not have a sphere of influence. Everyone has a sphere of influence. And I want you to picture the people in your life that you have the ability to shepherd and influence and pass down the truths of God to you. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your faithfulness and your promise and the way that you tell us that you will be sure to make your truths known throughout the world and that one day every knee will bow and everyone will confess that you are God. But in this time that we have now, in the life that you've given us, in the breath that we have, uh, may we be found faithful to share your love, to share your truth, to give the kids around us what they need to blossom in their own time and space so that they too can be a part of this kingdom story. God, we pray for a super bloom of believers. We know that's your heart, and we ask that you help us be found faithful to do our part. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Leah. Let's stand together. We're going to sing the blessing over one another. It's a, a fitting way to end our time. And this is, you know, part of this song is found in, in the book of Numbers, but another place that part of it's found is in Psalm 67. I just want to read these two verses before we sing. The psalmist says, May the Lord be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Why? Not for our own benefit, but that your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all generations. Let's keep that in mind as Anna leads us. Let's sing.
in that blessing in his name you guys have a blessed day